nothing energizes and liberates people more than the opportunity to shape and create their own future. I believe that what leaders and what companies must do is get people involved in co-creating and in shaping their futures. And by doing so, they will gain their uh, full attention and best performance and greatest contribution. Welcome to Create New Futures, thought-provoking conversations with leaders, experts, and interesting minds. Join us as we explore ideas and reflect on practices that you can use and apply to create and shape the future. With your host, author and strategy consultant, Aviv Shahar. Welcome to this special episode of Create New Futures. And on this occasion, I am bringing you the interview that Bill Fox conducted with me in his Forward 2.0 conversation series, where he interviews CEOs and thought leaders about the subject of workplaces and specifically how do we create workplaces where every voice matters, everyone thrives and finds meaning, and where change and innovation happen naturally? You can also find the somewhat cleaner and edited transcript of our conversation on the episode page. So without further ado, here is Bill's conversation with me. Viv, I was just sharing... Um... I read your book in preparation for this interview, and I was really taken aback by the depth and uh, coverage on the idea of conversations. And I found myself highlighting it so much, I had to just stop highlighting because I ended up highlighting the whole book. But when I started this interview series, I had this idea of an intention to ask these questions, to look at how we could create a better future workplace. But I didn't have a sense at the point of how powerful conversations could be. And one of the big learnings I've had of this interview series is really the power of conversations and the number of executives and CEOs who I interviewed and got back to me after they were observing what I was doing and started saying, we need to have this conversation in the workplace. And so I think that's a, you know, a wonderful marriage of what you're doing and what I'm doing and bringing that idea together. Yeah, that's great. That's uh, really the, the right kind and um, the delicious kind of response that you should be getting from CEOs in these kind of dialogues. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I, this started out really as an experiment. Um, and I came up with these questions and I really wasn't sure CEOs would be willing to answer them. So that was where I started out to make sure that this was going to be a useful conversation. And I got a lot of positive sort of feedback from some top CEOs when I first started doing this, and that really gave me the momentum and energy to keep this going. That's great. That's great, Bill. Yeah, thank you. So, Viv, thanks for your courage and um, willingness to take on these questions. Not everybody I ask is willing to, to respond to these questions. So uh, you're, you're in a special category there right from the start. And if you're ready, Aviv, I'll go ahead and, and we can run down through the six core questions I ask everyone, and then we'll go on to some other questions we, we thought about asking you. Yes, please. Okay. Our first question, Aviv, is how can we create workplaces where every voice matters, everyone thrives and finds meaning, and change and innovation happen naturally? So, Bill... Let me for a second or two just turn the tables around and, and ask you first back, because I know this, this is the, the core of the first question you ask to people you've interviewed. It is important to ask you, what was the genesis of this question in you? Uh, what was the trigger that catalyzed it? And, and then I can perhaps try to thread my way through this <laughs> uh, compound question. Yeah, that's a great question. And I love starting with that. But really, it started out, I'll try not to go back too far because there are a number of connections here, but really, it started 10 years ago when I, I was leading a transformation project. And for the third time in my career, after getting a, a transformation project to a great point of success, new executives 
uh, take over and all the work that was done just falls away. It's all flushed down the toilet. So that's when I set my intention, okay, how can I have an impact on how organizations transform? And I left that job without a job in sight and just let synchronicity and um, take over. And one of the first things I came up with was an interview series called Five Minutes to Process Improvement Success. And the leading question in that series was, what is your best improvement strategy that has worked really well for you? And from the very beginning, I never got an answer very seldomly about process. It was always something deeper. It was all about trust and understanding the status quo and things of that nature. And it was really surprising to me. And that really sort of ignited um, an inner leader journey for me to look at the deeper side of things. And after I did 50 interviews like that, I just felt this was no, never about process. And it was kind of silly to come on in this direction. So I set it aside and I said, you know, maybe something else will come up. So it took about a year and a half. And these questions bubbled up after a number of events. And maybe one of them was after we did a webinar called, are you tired of feeling like an alien in the workplace? And we had a group of people show up at that webinar who were so passionate, who felt like aliens in the workplace, who couldn't be what they really wanted to be. So that's how these questions came together. We wanted to say, okay, what does that workplace look like where everybody can thrive? And um, you know, what can we do to bring people together from both sides? Because typically we see employees and the leadership are on different ends of the spectrum. I'm glad I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm glad I asked you. So, so would, you, would you mind restating the question one more time and then let's see how uh, I can thread my way through it? Okay, I'd be happy to do that. How can we create workplaces where every voice matters, everyone thrives and finds meaning, and change and innovation happen naturally? So my experience and my sense with a powerful question like this is that, and, and certainly in the context of uh, the background that you offered, that how questions, questions that are anchored in, in the how, they often are emerging from a place of want and lack, as, as you just uh, shared in that experience. And therefore, they are often uh, not optimally conductive or attractive to bring forward the kind of intelligence and the energy that we hope will help us uh, redress and sufficiently address the want in the first place. So I, I prefer to reframe your question just slightly to help me find a different entry. A, a format of a question that can provide perhaps for both of us an elevated entry. So here is how I will reframe uh, the question. I would say the following. Imagine a workplace where every voice matters, everyone thrives and finds meaning, and change and innovation, they happen naturally. Imagine such workplace. Now tell us, please, what had to become true to enable such emergence? It's the same question, just uh, restated in the future state. And this is a formulation that provides a faster entry and a life-affirming path because it, it is anchored in the desired state rather than in the place of want and scarcity. And so if I look to try to respond to that question, I'll say that there are two short answers I can offer and one longer answer. The first short answer is interior based. So when, when I imagine a workplace where every voice matters and where people thrive and find meaning and will change and innovation happen naturally, I imagine a place, Bill, where 
we have made a leap forward where we've evolved as people. Actually, we've evolved as a species where sapient sapiens is not merely a name, but an actuality. So that's the short inner or interior answer. And of course, we can then talk about what had to become true to enable that outcome. And that would naturally lead us to the, the longer answer. The second short answer is more exterior, outward focusing. And here again, the, the short version is that when I imagine a workplace where people thrive and where they find meaning and will change and innovation happen naturally and where the reciprocity of work and its benefits bring the replenishment and the enhancement to all people involved, when I imagine a place like that, I uh, can envision a place where the entire socioeconomic framework and the capital system was transformed to shift from the short-term extractive bias that governs many companies and organizations today to a more sustainable, generative, and even life-giving seven generations forward orientation. So that's the second and the more exterior leaning framing of the answer. The, the third longer answer, which will double click on uh, those two, is that when I imagine a naturally arising and evolving workplace where people thrive by bringing forward the best ideas and best contribution and where the economic framework is aligned to help facilitate and bring forward the organizational and social equities that people want to cultivate and, and build and also aligned with the entire ecosystem emergent purpose and, and health. When I imagine that kind of an ecosystem, I imagine that we have overcome at least seven blockages. You can call them seven evolutionary or developmental blockages or stop situations. The first is the leadership blockage or stop situation. And I imagine that in this space that we are together now envisioning, we now have enlightened and illumined leaders. And obviously, we can talk about what's the journey that will facilitate that, but that's the number one stop situation or blockage that we have broken through. The second is the human development blockage or stop situation. And when I imagine that we are breaking through that one, I envision employees that engage with work as a development opportunity and in a way that enable them to transcend and embrace higher levels and higher stages of development, of creativity, of innovation, and of expression. So that's the second breakthrough in terms of human development. The third breakthrough is one where we are able to transform the winner-loser's impediment. And instead of the equation that for every winner, there must be many, 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 many losers in the now especially potentized and aggrandized winner takes all scenario, I envision a socioeconomic algorithm and paradigm that enables somewhat a rewired affairs of companies and uh, the whole machinations of the marketplace, one that enables many winners and where a new paradigm has been established and one that facilitates in people the creative and generative capacities and capabilities even much more so than today. And then I imagine in the fourth place that to enable this third a breakthrough there had to have been some kind of a new energy source breakthrough where we shifted from extractive paradigm to a multi-source sustainable and generative sources and resources. 
I'm talking about some technologies that, that are coming online and, and other technologies and capabilities that I imagine and I believe will come online in the next decade or two. And then in the fifth place, I imagine that for these to propagate all that we talked about so far, that the entire market machinery and its incentive systems is being rewired and that that enables a system-wide realignment and repositioning of the organizations that thrive in this newly realigned system. And six, that what happens uh, then is that as a result of all that I am in this utopian story that I'm giving you occurs is that the third blood system, the, the blood system of distrust and suspicion, because that's what f- what's flowing and motivating and powering today many, many people in the workplace and in the business and in the marketplace, that that to a degree or to a major degree has been absorbed and replaced with the currency of trust and co-creation. And finally, I'd say in the seventh place that this entire utopian future that I'm describing is enabled and supported by series of breakthroughs and evolution in consciousness, where enlightenment and illumination are the bread and butter of everyday living and not the property of a secluded elite that have chosen to embark on that specialized journey. So uh, in summation, I'd I'd say, Bill, that this is obviously an audacious utopian future. But remember that utopian visions often uh, tend to get realized and actualized a century later. And perhaps on this occasion, uh, we will not have to wait for 100 years. So I'll offer these as as three-layered response to the question. Yeah, thank you for that uh, comprehensive, insightful response, Aviv. Um, a lot to consider and think about there. And maybe I'll just briefly comment on a couple of things that stuck with me through all that. And one was I, I really appreciate the way you rephrased that question, uh, especially after reading your book. And from time to time, I've tuned in to maybe that question needs adjustment. And um, I, I love what you presented there on how to look at that. And then you talked about the internal change uh, of the people. And that's really kind of the story underneath of me doing this work. When I started uncovering what was underneath in these conversations with people and creating conditions where I was open and they could felt comfortable speaking whatever was on their mind or whatever their truth was, it's, it started changing me from the inside out. It started changing my state of being. It started changing my consciousness. And that's a a journey that continues. But I see that's so important in in bringing about this type of transformation. Yeah, that's awesome. Essentially, you're validating validating what I've offered in in my response then. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And there was more I could validate too that that, that parallels and um, validates what you have spoken to. But Uh, We could probably spend a day going through that. I don't know if I could remember everything at this point. So that'll be excellent to uh, jump off of the interview when it comes together to take that further. Great. Okay. Our second question, Aviv, is what does it take to get an employee's full attention and best performance? So, Bill, my experience with this very important question is that nothing energizes and liberates people more than the opportunity to shape and create their own future. That's why this is the central element of my work. And so I believe that what leaders and what companies must do is get people involved in co-creating and in shaping their futures, the, the future of the organization, the future of the business, future of the department, the future of the function. And by doing so, they will gain their uh, full attention and best performance and greatest contribution. I believe it so strongly that I have created a whole thriving practice uh, around that uh, belief and that core tenet. 
And especially when I work with senior teams in, in Fortune 100 companies, one of the key ideas is that if you are to create and unleash an organizational, like throughout organizational movement, then you must bring people into that kind of conversation. So that, that's how I will offer to think about the conundrum of creating and facilitating a full, fuller engagement and unleashing the fullest creativity of your people. Excellent. Yeah, a little background on that question was, this question came about because when I met with leaders or executives and just the conversations in general everywhere, th this seems to be what most are focused on. You know, how do we get that performance and results? And I, I was really try, trying to capture another perspective on this that, that goes back to what we're trying to, to do here. The third question, what do people really lack and long for at work? Well, once again, uh, Bill, I believe there are two aspects to this. There, there is the interior and the exterior dimensions, as in most questions we reflect on. Whether they know it or not, people long for self-insight. People long for getting themselves back. And when you get yourself back, that's a big part of perhaps what you're looking for, because inside it, you've got to then consider also getting to appreciate the human condition overall and also your own conditioning. And then finding inside it your strength and appreciating that inside your strength, there also may be a weakness. And also that inside your weakness, there may be a latent strength. As you know, for example, there are many dyslexic people who are brilliant and found ways to lead and transform and bring tremendous innovation into a variety of spaces. So it's just one example of how self-insight and how understanding your superpower, which includes appreciating your weakness and how inside your weakness there may be a latent strength, is powerful. So these are mission-critical insights, I believe, if you are to manifest your gifts and talent and to bring forward your greatest contribution. I think also that people long for a variety of other properties or, or, or qualities or energies, if you like. I think we all need and seek connectedness. And we all seek and or need respect, dignity, opportunity. And human beings, we, you know, we need to be seen and, and recognized. And we hope to be given the opportunity to influence and shape our destiny. All those are naturally arising longings in human beings. And when these needs are met at work, they tend to unleash incredible power and creativity and resourcefulness. And this naturally would include the opportunity to, again, to contribute to a meaningful purpose, one that affords us the feeling that we are serving and are part of something even bigger than ourselves. This is truly the, the biggest, perhaps, creativity and innovation release factor, that sense that we are serving a purpose, a mission that we can identify with, that we can believe in, and that through that, we, through that mission and purpose and our contrib contribution, we get to express our talent and capabilities. That is, I believe, what people long for at work. Yeah, that response really spoke to me, Aviv, in, in, in several ways, but the whole idea of self-insight and the idea of doing the work that I am doing and operating from a level of intention and having a more meaningful impact, it, it really allows you to harvest who you are, that creative part of you, and, 
and harvest that and, and let that show up. And I think the other fascinating thing for me has been how that connects you to a big idea where ideas and people come from somewhere else. The, the right people show up, the right ideas show up. You know, most of it isn't m- me. It's it, you become maybe a vortex or a focal point for for that conversation and those ideas to unfold, so to speak. Yeah, great. Our fourth question, Aviv, what do you think is the most important question leadership or management should be asking their employees or followers? I'd be encouraging leaders to ask their employees, what will help you create your biggest contribution? And perhaps in an even broader stated way, I'd offer that they ask the following. Imagine a day at work when you feel energized and excited about what we are doing here and about your contribution. Describe what you're doing and specifically what enables you to perform so well at such a high level. That's the question I'd encourage leaders to ask their teams. Very good. And what about, let's turn it around. What do you think is the most important question employees should be asking back to management or leadership? I'd encourage employees to ask their managers and leaders and senior management the following question. Describe to us, please, the most inclusive, the most energizing future you imagine for our organization. What are we doing differently in this future? What new outcomes will we create? How are we showing up in the world differently? That's an excellent, big, big question. I like that one. And now I'm curious, what do you think is the most important question we should be asking ourselves? Well, the central inquiry for my life since uh, very earlier on, I'd say since... um, 16, 17, 18, 19, all the way to uh, 60 uh, next week, (laughs) Uh, has been the question of purpose. Why are we here on earth? What purpose are we here to serve individually and collectively? What do we hope future generations will be saying about us and about the contribution that we worked hard to leave behind? Great. Those are the six core questions we ask in every interview. And uh, I came up with a few others after reading your book. And if you're ready to go there, we can go ahead and start on those. Please. Okay. You've written a book called Create New Futures, How Leaders Produce Breakthroughs and Transform the World Through Conversation. What prompted you to write the book? Bill, it's probably a combination of three impulses. I believe first is the natural desire and need to share and to transfer to others the work I do and what enables me to produce the kind of outcomes that I help leaders and teams create. A sense that that sense of wanting to give back and offer the experience of my development journey. So that's the first impulse. Second is the observation that often a group of very smart people, when they come around the table, they will often tend to produce collective stupidity instead of collective wisdom. And I attempted in the book to help teams transcend their collective stupidity syndrome and produce instead collective wisdom through their kind of techniques and processes and and insights and questions because I find it to be disconcerting and depressing and upsetting when brilliant people, when put together, are able to only produce suboptimal outcome instead of the multiplication of their natural brilliance. So that's the second impulse. And the third is the game 
changing realization and a game changing insight that conversation is the currency of work and is the currency of leadership and that we lead and transform our environments and the organizations we participate in and lead through conversation that that conversation is the core mechanism to enable and facilitate change transformation and the evolution of an organization on the path to enable and to create a whole new future. Let me jump to this question where there's a quote from your book, Aviv. I'll read the quote and then ask you to comment on it because I think it relates to what just came up in your response. But in the book, you said, conversations are game changers. Through conversations, we transform ourselves, those around us, and our environments. Ultimately, conversations allow us to shape possibilities, choose the best future imaginable, and make it a reality. Is there a story you can share that brought you to that understanding? Uh, yes, of course I can, Bill. Uh, firstly, let me say it, it is indeed uh, curious and validating that you, of, of everything in the book you've chosen this one quote, because if you said to me, what is the one takeaway that I hope people will take from creating futures, then it would be exactly that, that conversations are that kind of a game changer and that we, through conversation, are able to transform ourselves and the world around us. So thank you for that. The, the story, or perhaps where this begins for me, the, the first defining moment was during the 1973 war in Israel. I was at the time a 14-year-old in the kibbutz where I was growing. And at the time, my father was serving as the secretary general of the kibbutz. And what he did was he convened every evening gatherings to facilitate conversation and to help people process the shock and the grief and the anxiety and the fear because for a few days the survival of Israel was hanging in the balance. And as I observed, because uh, we were allowed even at that age to join and, and be in attendance, as, as I observed, what I saw was that through dialogue you could convert despair into hope and fear into encouragement and confidence. And pain could be transformed into bonded conviction in a better future. And I then recognized, even if not fully consciously at that time, but over time as I reflected on that, I recognized that that was indeed the function and the job of a leader to unleash possibilities to help people discover how they can bring forward their best contributions. And I realized that you did those things as a leader through conversation and through the development and the facilitation of this kind of transformative inquiry. Little did I know uh, back then that this was going to be defining and setting in motion the work I will do many years later. But indeed today, that's what I am doing with leadership teams. And they tell me that when they are with me in the room, they're able to listen to each other differently and to, in and through those dialogues, ask each other new questions. And that these conversations enable them and help them see old challenges through new lens and thereby unleash new innovative ideas. And that as a result, they're able sometime in three days come together to agreements and decisions that otherwise would take three or six months or more likely uh, will never be reached. And as part of that process, what I then do is I help teams identify 
the difference between displaced to efficacious conversations, which is something that I explain and go into uh, in the book Creating Futures. And the point there is that to create effective and efficacious conversations, conversations that mobilize movement and action, we need to anchor those conversations in the true and real need that we're looking to serve. Displaced conversations fail to address a need. And as a result, they become often complaint-based discussion. And I offer that complaint is the uh, misdirection or, or complaint is a misdirected energy of an unaddressed need. And efficacious conversation is one that leads to requests and proposals and ultimately to agreements as to how to address a need and thereby they enable us to unleash the kind of movement and action that we need. So that's the story I will offer Bill as the defining genesis of uh, conversation as the game changer that facilitate transformation. That's such an interesting story, Aviv, and, and so interesting how what I pulled out of your book was so meaningful to you. And I, I feel compelled to share a real quick story about that time in history. Um, I had just entered the U.S. Navy in the past year before that happened. And when that war broke out, I was aboard a nuclear submarine off the coast of Hawaii somewhere. And without warning, we came ashore in the middle of the night, loaded food and unimaginable weapons. And by sunrise, we were off. We had no idea where. We didn't know what was going on. But it felt like the end of the world. And that was a, an amazing experience to have, to think, you know, what, something very serious is going on. Is the world going to blow itself up here now at this point in time? But that, that, that type of experience changes you forever. You look at things completely differently after an experience like that. Yeah, that's riveting. And uh, moving to now. Thank you. Aviv, you may partially answer this already, but I'll, I'll see if you have anything else to add to this. But what do you think makes your book different from other books on the topic about the future? The book is not formulaic. To, to be transparent, I generally don't like <laughs> business books that offer the, the four steps, the six steps, the seven steps, and you, you must completely embrace the formula of the book to make sense of it. So I, I set out to write a different kind of book. And um, my aspiration was that you'll be able to open any page and find one idea or one practice that is relevant, that you can immediately apply and get results and improve your situation and help you in whatever challenge you face. And secondly, or thirdly, that the book can be read in three ways. You can read the book as most people read books, which is from beginning to end. Secondly, as I suggested, you can open anywhere you like, read a page and put the book down and go about your life and work with the idea that you found in that page. And thirdly, you can choose to read the epilogue and get the deeper sense of what motivated me in the first place, and then read the book from the beginning with that awareness in mind. So uh, for these reasons, and for also the stories and autobiographical vignettes, I um, consider the, the book to be somewhat different than the generic uh, business book. You've offered us a lot of good takeaways here already, Aviv, but since I had the question about the key takeaways, I guess I'll go ahead and ask it anyway to see if there's anything else you would like to mention. 
Well, the first is what uh, I just, uh, we discussed, which uh, is the idea that conversations can be game changers and that conversation itself is the currency of leadership. And when people say, okay, so I, I get that, but what's the difference once I internalize that idea, I'd offer that there are three differences. First, you will show up to work remembering that conversation is a two-way exchange. It's a complete loop, and you will therefore work as hard as you can to not allow the conversation loop be broken. People too many times in the workplace think of communication as a one-way traffic, but we talked about unleashing the creativity in people. To do that, you need to facilitate the completion of the conversation loop. That's number one. Number two, once you recognize that conversation is your currency as a leader, it empowers you, Bill, to ask, what is the conversation I must be? You can step into work meetings and apply uh, those very lens which is to ask, are we in the right conversation? Or should we reframe or restate this conversation? And if we are in the right conversation, are we approaching this conversation in the smartest, most impactful way? Because all of a sudden there is a new measure, you know, uh, metrics and measures are very important in the workplace because they help us hold ourselves accountable to what matters to us. Well, if conversation is the currency of work, what's the metric that goes with that? Well, the metric that goes with that is, have we been able to produce the outcomes that we intended to produce in this meeting or in that conference or in that workshop, whatever the, the case is? And all of a sudden, impact and effectiveness is measured through how true are we in the results we created to our initial intent? And have we led the conversation from point A to point B or point C or, or, or point Z, whatever the conclusion, in the most effective way, such that we are now able to accelerate the kind of uh, action we want to see? And thirdly, why it matters to embrace the idea that conversation is the currency of work is that it then leads you to the next realization, which is if we stay in the same old conversation, well, then by definition, by design, we will end up where we already are. Creating new futures begins with creating a new conversation. So the practical implication is for leaders and for all employees to ask ourselves, what is the conversation we're in? Are we in a reactive conversation that digs deeper and deeper in the problem? Or are we in a conversation that restates the, the challenges we're looking at and bring forward a new kind of ideas and wisdom to facilitate not only the resolution and the solution to the issues we are grappling today, but one that forwards the desired future state. So I'd offer these additional layers of, of uh, meaning to that initial uh, takeaway. Excellent additional points, Aviv. And what that brings up for me is this idea of the power of conversations has been around for a while, and I can't remember maybe when I first encountered it. But I, I do remember years back hearing that idea and it didn't really touch me. You know, how, how could conversations be so, so powerful? I, I really didn't give it much attention. And what happened for me when I started undergoing these internal changes, things quiet down inside. The voice inside your head and what's going on there isn't so loud. It's not worried about making its next point. There's, there's more space for you to really hear the other person. And, and then you really hear the other person and, and you learn something new almost every time, so, something fascinating. It, it, 
you really learn to be in a conversation. And I guess the question that's leading to that I want to ask you is, how have you dealt with that idea of conversation? Do you experience that when you bring up the idea of a conversation? Do, do people minimize it? And I'm, I'm wondering if you have any ideas on how we can help people get that idea or experience it in a bigger way. Yeah, it's an excellent question, Bill. So I typically would not be opening the workshop uh, with a team with this insight as the, as the first thing. How I come into this is by introducing people to the idea of entering the learning zone. And the first idea that, that I often offer is based on the debrief practice that was drilled into me back when I was trained uh, as a fighter pilot in the Israeli Air Force. And the ethos of that organization was learning, learning, learning. But learning not just as a superficial construct. Learning in the deepest possible way is what I've taken and made central. So then, as you yourself alluded to in the end of what you said there, conversation becomes a learning a mechanism, a learning medium. And I first lead people simply into a set of experiences where they engage with each other to debrief what's working well and what are the opportunity areas. And then through a series of conversations about the future that they desire and, and aspire for in their company and with their organization. And by choreographing, if you like, these conversations for people, I first give them the experience before I turn around and say, do you realize we've been in, in a new kind, in a whole new set of conversations? And through these conversations, you're able to create new sense of agreement and alignment. So rather than me teaching it to them, I create for them the experience because I, I do believe very much that with adults and with the insights that we bring to the table about adult learning, and how adult learning is one that's accessed through experience, and especially through experience that enable those adults to bring to the table the knowledge and the know-how they have acquired previously, and just somewhat rearrange it or bring it up to, up to date, that that is the most powerful uh, learning for adults by facilitating and choreographing those experiences for them, it then becomes very natural to share with them the idea that conversation is the currency of leadership and how they can, as leaders, lead accelerated transformation uh, with their teams. Very nice. Thank you. Aviv, we're coming up here on the end of our time, and I'm wondering if there's anything you would like to close with or bring up? I will simply uh, circle back to the purpose inquiry. My feeling and, and impulse has always been, Bill, that life is precious, that this is not a dress rehearsal, <laughs> that uh, we're living the one life we were given, and that life is just too short and too precious to not be engaged with conversations that promote meaning, innovation, and facilitate for, for you and for the people around you new possibilities and future. And I, I'd encourage anybody uh, listening to our dialogue to, to do that, to find the opportunity to lead and facilitate these conversations in their life today. That's, That's what beautiful. I'd offer. That's beautiful, Aviv. Thank you. Excellent closing statement. <laughs>